Anyway, so last Saturday, as our men's retreat was coming to a close, CFLM snoring champion Sean McCone uh, interrupted our game of euchre with the news that Israel had just declared war on Palestine. And as we sat there, uh, we started asking questions such as, what does that mean? Uh, we pondered it on the return drive from Bedford to Mainville. What did that mean politically? What did that mean economically? What did, did that mean eschatologically? Or in other words, biblically? Like, is this a sign of the end? Now, hours before, as we sat gathered in a comfortable lounge full of recliners and sofas with coffee in one hand and Terry Levistro's brownies in the other, you know, we, with, with, in our comfort, we wrestled with all these threats. Uh, we, we pondered threats from potentially China, from Russia, and, and, and we wondered, what do we, what do we do with this information? What do we do with wars and rumors of wars? Now, such a question has as many rabbit trails as a group of men are willing to explore, and if you've spent much time with the men of this church, uh, you know we are experts at chasing rabbits. <laughs> now, questions such as, what do we do to prepare for that? And what do we do to avoid that? Each have their place in time, but with Jeremiah in mind, I, I knew I was preaching a week from that day, you know, with that in mind, I was fascinated by the rabbit trail of how do we live in a conquered land? How do we live in a conquered land? How, in other words, do we endure? Surely, as their nation fell, many would have thought it was the end of the world. When is a land conquered? I looked at several attempts to answer this question, and they all came back to control. When one takes control of another land, whether by force or by cessation or treaty, you've conquered it. And so... When did Nebuchadnezzar conquer Judah? For instance, was it when Judah became a vassal of Babylon and many of the skilled young men were exiled along with the treasures of the temple? Or was it three years later when Jehoiakim sought an alliance with Egypt to revolt only to see himself killed and thrown over the city gates? Or was it when the last king of Judah, Zedekiah, watched as the temple was destroyed, his children were executed before his very eyes, which were then gouged out from their sockets? Or was it years before when kings and prophets and priests and people turned from God in their hearts to worship idols? They lost control of the land and temple in 586 BC, but they had lost control of themselves long, long before. The people were conquered long before the land. Now, I do not intend to force what I see in the world right now to fit with where we are in the book of Jeremiah. There is a whole lot that is not the same. We are not a nation in covenant with the living God, with blessings on the one hand and curses on the other. We did not start our nation by proclaiming blessings and curses from valleys, uh, though maybe we should have. Uh, we are not the nation um, through whom God sent prophets to, to pro proclaim the oracles of God. We are not the people through whom the Messiah of all the nations has come. But we are a nation, and God holds all nations accountable. For governing authorities are his servants, avengers who bring wrath on those who practice evil. And so like those in the days of Judah, the talking heads have turned from God in their hearts to worship and serve idols. We may not be a conquered land, but I am confident we are a conquered culture. We can glean insights in enduring a conquered culture by looking at how they endured exile, how they endured living in a pagan land where those in power hated them. And so when everything is hitting the fan, what do you do? Uh, when surrounded by liars and war, where do you start? And so returning to the book of Jeremiah, we shall contend with a difficult but ultimately beautiful, glorious, and encouraging truth, a timeless truth for all those chosen of God, an enduring truth, the truth that God has planned good for us, and that good includes suffering. God has good plans for Judah, and those plans included exile. Now, we struggle to accept that as much as they did in Jeremiah's day, and so I pray, do not harden your hearts as they did. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we have the opportunity to read your word, to study your word, to cherish your word, to be convicted by your word, to be confused by your word, to to be led by your word. Lord, I pray that as, as we make our way through Jeremiah, um, the message would be faithful to your word. And I pray that if any of it is not, that it would be forgiven and forgotten. Lord, I pray that 
we would be challenged, encouraged, and, and really led by what we see in your word this morning. Oh, Lord, we love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so to, to wrestle with this wonderful truth, uh, we're going to begin in a situation in which many of you may find yourselves regularly, and that is surrounded by liars. So go ahead and turn to Jeremiah chapter 21. Uh, I'm just going to quickly highlight a few things. So left, last week we left off with the trash talk in the temple and around Jeremiah 20. And so I just want to highlight a few things between that situation and where we are this morning. Now in Jeremiah 21, we, see, we be reminded there were three waves of exile. And so we find ourselves between the second and third wave. Jehoiakim, Josiah's oldest son, is dead. Jehoiachin, again, say it like Street Fighter and you'll have fun. Jehoiachin, uh, Jehoiachin, Jehoiakim's son, reigned for three months, but he was ultimately taken captive. And Zedekiah, Josiah's third son, yes, it is a messy family tree. Um, he is now Nebuchadnezzar's puppet king. And so the temple remains, but God has vacated its premises. And so as has been a theme in this series, among the first casualties of a godless nation is truth. And so looking at briefly at chapter 21, uh, we see that Pasher, the priest who put Jeremiah in stocks, along with Zephaniah, another priest, go to Jeremiah. You see, Nebuchadnezzar has started to close in, and Pasher's like, well, this is kind of what Jeremiah had said. Uh, maybe we should go talk to him. Jeremiah, can we have words of blessing? And Jeremiah says, <laughs> too late for that. Uh, so you can imagine how that went. Moving ahead to chapter 22, and yeah, be ready to flip some pages. You're getting like one to two set in summary here. You're getting cliff notes real quick until we get to chapter 28. In chapter 22, Jeremiah continues to wrestle with the Lord, and at the same time, we see he goes through and, and lays out a series of woes and prophecies against all of the, the wicked kings since King Josiah. Chapter 23, though, we're going to pause there for just a moment. It starts off with a lambasting of false prophets, but not before one of the most incredible passages in all of Jeremiah. And so let's go ahead and look at verses 1 through 4. But before we do, go ahead, if you're the type that writes in your Bible, and if you're not, if you're not go ahead and become one. I, I would write next in your, in your margins, uh, John 10, 1 through 10. John 10, 1 through 10. There, just to summarize it, I want you to see, see this from the lens of the New Testament. There, Jesus declared he is the door of the sheep. There, he declared he is the good shepherd. Those who came before him were thieves and robbers, but he is the one whose voice the sheep will follow. He is the one who will love and care for his sheep. And so with that in mind, hear these words from Jeremiah 23, 1 through 4. Woe to the shepherds who are causing the sheep of my pasture to perish and are scattering them, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not been concerned about them. Behold, I, who? I, the Lord, am going to call you to, to account for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Then I myself, who? I, the Lord will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. I'd encourage you to underline that phrase. We're going to be talking about it again shortly. I will also raise up shepherds over them, and will tend, they will tend them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. And so we may be surrounded by liars, but be encouraged. He who is the truth is gathering his flock and is raising up faithful shepherds. Be encouraged. He who is the truth dwells within you if you are a believer. You need not fear. You need not be worried about anything you see going, going on if the one who is the truth dwells within you. And so if you are sick of this world's lies and disinformation, find rest in the living and active truth of the, of the Lord. Now, we continue on, chapter 24, we see figs and fibs, figs and fibs. Now, imagine for a moment our neighbors in the promised land of Kentucky uh, have, have grown tired of our trash talk, tired of our incestuous jokes, tired of sharing their bourbon, tired of all the horsing around. There you go, there you go. Thank you for the three of you. Yes. 
And they rise up, invaded Ohio, and took away many to tend the horses and distilleries. Now, those who are, I'm from Kentucky, I can say it with pride. So, those who remained may well conclude they are the ones who are blessed. They are the ones who develop a survivorship bias. You know, the ones taken off to Kentucky, they, they are the ones cursed of God. We who remain are the ones blessed. However, what we see in, in chapter 24 is the Lord says through Jeremiah, <laughs> no, you've got it all wrong. Uh, and so with an illustration of figs, we see there's this rotten pile of figs and this good basket of figs. And it's the rotten figs that represent the ones who stayed. And it's the good figs that represent the ones who were taken away into exile. And so there's this, this conflict. And so this would be a very powerful thing for them to see because you would think the ones who stayed, we're the ones who, ble- who are blessed. Now, chapter 25, up until this point in Jeremiah, the prophet has not yet named the king or nation who would conquer them. Now he does. Naming Nebuchadnezzar, God's servant, as the one who will punish Judah in 25.9. Now, in spite of the terror of this news, there's actually some comedy here. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's name uh, truly was actually Nebuchadrezzar. Now, why, why has it been preserved as Nebuchadnezzar over the years? Well, ulti- ultimately, it's, it's an act of trolling. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mockery. So, for, for example, Nebuchadrezzar translates Nabu, a Bob- Babylonian god, protect my heir or descendants. So what does Nebuchadnezzar mean? It means God protect the jackass or donkey. <laughs> and so if you don't like those words, take it up with Jeremiah. Uh, but, but that's exactly what we see. And so we see there's this, this powerful you know, joke written in and preserved. You know, if you ask anybody who the king of Babylon was, even historically, it's Nebuchadnezzar. God protected the jackass. And so it's just fascinating how how this gets preserved over time. It is also about this time that Jeremiah takes Baruch as a secretary and begins prophesying of an exile of 70 years, about which we will say more momentarily. Chapter 26, accounts of an assassination plot by King Jehoiakim and other faithless leaders to kill Jeremiah, a plot thwarted by God through some of the faithful forgotten unnamed officials who reminded the people that God's prophets often come with difficult messages. Now, at this point, uh, hopefully, you've been reading chapter by chapter, as you were encouraged to do, because otherwise, listen, listen to all everything you're missing. Chapter 27, it kicks off with the reign of Zedekiah, bad king, at which time Jeremiah became an object lesson for the people. And so making for himself bonds and yokes, uh, wearing them around the city, sending messages to other nations that they, too, would be bound and conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, preaching a message of surrender. Give up, and you'll live. Don't give up, and you will die by the sword. Now, do you think that went over well in Judah? No. Uh, if, if you have a guy walking around in stocks like this, just surrender, you'll be fine. Surrender, you'll be fine, or you will end up like this. The masses are going to see that and be like, what a lunatic. You know, what an idiot. What a fool. Which brings us to chapter 28 where we see Jeremiah has to contend with liars at home in Jerusalem as well as liars afar in Babylon. And so starting off in chapter 28, looking at verses 1 through 4, we'll start there. And I'm just going to pause a few times just to give a little bit of context as we go. Now in the same year, what year? That is the same year Jeremiah started wearing this yoke uh, around town and telling people that a 70-year exile is coming. In that year, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, in the fifth month, when are we historically approximately 594, less than 10 years before the temple would fall? So we're less than 10 years out. Hananiah, the prophet, the son of Azor, who was from Gibeon, spoke to me at the house of the Lord in the sight of the priests and all the people, saying, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I am going to bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took from this place and brought to Babylon. I am also going to bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the exiles of Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now, before you fault the people for buying into these lies, remember... We have the gift of hindsight. 
certainly we wouldn't be persuaded by such nonsense, uh, such hopeful words in the midst of a crisis. Note, this was a pretty conservative message. Uh, certainly, we wouldn't be persuaded to make America great again, uh, which is basically the, the message that Hananiah is saying here about Judah, make Judah great again, uh, or, or the message of building back better. There's no way we would be deceived and want to have our ears tickled by, by listening to exactly what we want to hear. Now, the power of deception is that it takes hold of something within us that we long for. Blessed is the man who trusts the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. And so if your trust is in anyone or anything else, you're already deceived. You're already ripe for twisting and manipulation. Now, Hananiah made the mistake that fa good false prophets, if there is such a thing, he made the mistake that good false prophets do not make. He made it too specific. He put an expiration date on his prophecy. He said, two years. Two years, and the treasures and the king and the exiles shall return. It's a condemnation upon Hananiah that he didn't say that God would return, because I suspect that Hananiah didn't even know God had left. Now, for weeks or months, it looks like Jeremiah had been going around wearing this yoke, saying surrender. Just imagine that. Imagine for months, uh, you've been driving in, into the church, and somebody standing over on the corner just walking around in a yoke saying, surrender, surrender, just give in, just give in. You, you would roll your eyes at such a man. You, you, you would scoff at such a man. And yet that's exactly the man that God has called to, do, to bring his message. We continue. Because we see Hananiah was sick of that message. Verse 5. Then Jeremiah the prophet spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the sight of the priest and in the sight of all the people who were standing at the house of the Lord. And Jeremiah the prophet said, Amen! Now pause for a moment. I really want to know in what the tone of that amen was. Uh, like, I, I wish I could be there to hear it. Like, was it sarcastic? Like, amen. Uh, or was it serious? Amen! You know, how did he say it? Uh, I would really, really want to know. My, what I suspect is that that amen was one of desperate longing. Amen! Because just think about it. You know, if you're Jeremiah, you know that God has changed his mind before. Now, not in a crazy sense, but in the sense that before God changed his mind about destroying the, the Hebrew people when Moses interceded, God had changed his mind just some years before with Hezekiah about a curse that had ma been made upon him. And so with all that in mind, when Jeremiah hears this prophet come and says, hey, I know that it's been said 70, but it's only going to be two. I imagine that, that Jeremiah's response is, I hope you're right. Please be right. Yes. And so I, I imagine that's what he is longing for. Wouldn't you want to be wrong if that is your message? He continues. And, and as we read on, we, it's almost as though he suspects it. It's like, amen. But man, I don't feel good about this. <laughs> so, May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill your words, which you have prophesied to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all the exiles from Babylon to this place. Yet, hear now the word which I am going to speak to you, so that you and all the people can hear it. The prophets who were before me and before you from ancient times also prophesied against many lands and against great kingdoms regarding war, disaster, and plague. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, then... That prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. And so how do you discern between a false prophet and a true prophet? Time. You wait and see. And so do their words come true or not? Reading this reminded me of comedian Bill Engvall and others who used to have a series of jokes with the punchline, here's your sign. Now, perhaps you're unfamiliar with those, so just to give you an example of such a, such a joke. So say that we were to walk outside... And you said, Sean, is that our expansion? And, and I responded with something like, no, it's, uh, it's just Howard's new suka. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, now, the response might be, here's your sign. You know, obviously, it's the expansion. You have proven to be stupid in the way that you've just spoken. Now, I think that Jeremiah's response sounds like a here's your sign moment. Uh, he's like, false prophets often speak of peace. You messed up, Hananiah. Uh, you said two years. <laughs> that's, that's, that's your sign. Uh, and so let's wait and see whose words come to pass, you fool. 
In response, Hananiah, and this is where it gets really dramatic. This is where I bet most people watching would have been totally on the side of Hananiah. Because Hananiah is like, okay, fair enough. Let me take that yoke off you and slam and destroy it. And so that's exactly what he does. This is like in big churches when they come out with chains and throw it off to show that we've been freed of our sin. Right? This is dramatic. This is exciting. This is, this is huge. And so stirring up the emotions of the people, they're like, yeah, that's what we want to see. And so who do you think the people, whose side do you think the people were on? Hananiah's. They're like, that's what we want to see. We don't want 70 years. We only want two, but it's better than 70. And so we see that this does not go well for Hananiah because painful truths are better than comforting lies. We continue, verse 12. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from the neck of Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and just, I wonder, was this, how devastating was it for Jeremiah to hear this? Go and speak to Hananiah, saying, This is what the Lord says. You have broken the yokes of wood, but in their place you have made yokes of iron. For this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations to serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. And I have also given him the animals of the field. Then Jeremiah the prophet said to Hananiah the prophet, Listen now, Hananiah. The Lord has not sent you, and you have made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Behold, I am going to remove you from the face of the earth. This year you are going to die, because you spoke falsely against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died in the same year in the seventh month. In other words, Hananiah's message was two years. God's response was, I'll give you two more months. That's how this message went for him. And so we see that he had to deal with liars at home, but he also had to deal with liars far away. Uh, For example, we see, we're going to look at the good news of Jeremiah 29 momentarily. I know we've all been desperately longing for that uh, happy word in the middle of chapter 29. We'll get there momentarily, but I got us surrounded by all the misery. You're welcome. Uh, And so go ahead and look ahead to verse 21. Now, at this point, chapter 29, verse 21, letters are being delivered back and forth from Judah to Babylon. And just as we have fake news now, they had fake news then. And so we, ha- we see with Ahab and Zedekiah, verse 21, <clears throat> this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says concerning Ahab, the, the son of Kaliah, and concerning Zedekiah, the son of Messiah. That is not the king Zedekiah, by the way, just to clarify, but a different liar. Um, And so, concerning these men who are prophesying to you falsely in my name, behold, I am going to hand them over to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will kill them before your eyes. Because of them, a curse will be used by all the exiles from Judah who are in Babylon, saying, may the Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire because they acted foolishly in Israel and committed adultery with their neighbor's wives and falsely spoke words in my name, which I did not command them. I am he who knows and a witness, declares the Lord. Note for a moment, though, how God treats the faithful in comparison to the faithless. Because in your margins, if you're a writing person in your margins and become one, Uh, Daniel chapter 3, verses 19 through 30. Write that right next to this passage. Daniel chapter 3, verses 19 through 30. Because there, we see a faithful Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were cast into the very same fiery furnace that these false prophets were cast into. The only difference is they came back out. Uh, They had one who protected over them when they were cast into the fire. They remained faithful uh, even when... They were being called to disobey by those in power over them. And so we see that God honors and blesses those who are faithful here, whereas those who are not are condemned. They are cursed. And so we continue on with Shemaiah. Now, with regards to Shemaiah, I'm just going to summarize some of his stuff for the sake of time. Uh, more or less, it's, it's more of the same. Shemaiah, in, in verses 24 through 31 is yet another false prophet. He's, he's claimed the priesthood and said, hey, hey, priests, why don't you take care of Jeremiah back home? Uh, because he's saying it's going to be a long exile when we all know it's going to be a short one. 
And so this, this, one of his letters is taken by a priest, read before Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, like he usually does, says, well, curses to you. And, and so as a result, we see, see that Shemaiah, Shemaiah's demise is declared as well. Now, why, when we have such good news waiting for us in Jeremiah 29, did I give so much attention to all this bad news, uh, to all the liars that are surrounding Jeremiah? Ultimately, it's to encourage and to warn you. Did God's word endure then when surrounded by liars? Thank you, Ben. Let's, let's try again. Did God's word endure then when surrounded by liars? Yes, yes it did. How much more then, this side of the cross, will God's word endure now? Right? And so, Satan, our adversary, knows how to tickle our ears. Don't stand for it. Do not give the enemy a foothold. Do not live by lies. Do not tolerate lies. Do not utter lies. Do not give in to lies. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Be men and women of truth, no matter the cost. To be more specific, some of you have jobs that are going to require you to lie if they haven't already. Don't, right? Don't do it. Schools require us to play make-believe about the human anatomy. Be people of truth. Ultimately, in the economy of eternity, the cost is not worth your soul. And so stand firm. Be people of truth. It might cost you something, but I promise you that the cost now is nothing compared to the cost later. Stand firm. Nebuchadnezzar, like Jeremiah, was surrounded by liars, but he also had true prophets of the living God within his midst, standing in his presence as witnesses against him. And this was not unique to Nebuchadnezzar. Time and time again through Scripture, we see God has placed the people in God has placed his people to be witnesses before those in high places. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, who was it who was placed before him? Daniel. Daniel standing there as a witness, speaking constantly against Nebuchadnezzar. Just previously in this study, we talked about King Manasseh, who was one of the most wicked kings in all of the history of Judah. Do you know who stood before King Manasseh? Zephaniah. Even in a time when the prophets were being wiped out, Zephaniah's very name means hidden of the Lord or hidden of God. God had hidden that man within the midst of Manasseh as a witness against him. Now, why do I say this? Well, do you think God has stopped doing this? When it comes to, to people in high places today, whether it be the Bidens, the Putins, the Zelenskys, whoever they may be, certainly God has placed his people in their midst who are calling, to, calling them to account. People who one day are going to stand as witness against them. And so let that be an encouragement to you. If you are tired of being absolutely lied to, rest assured, it's going to stop. The truth is going to come out, even if it's not this side of eternity. And know that there are witnesses that God has placed right now who are going to testify of every careless word that has been uttered against him. Remain faithful. Be encouraged by that. I, I, I can't do anything right here about a lot of the lies that I see in the world, right? I can't do anything when I see presidents lying and I see leaders lying. But I know that God is doing something about it. Be encouraged by that. And so, how shall we then live? How do they endure exile? How do we live in a conquered culture in a world surrounded by liars? If you are hungry to hear that, I pray these words are a steak dinner for a famished follower. Even though I pulled pork's better, but we can debate about that later. So, how shall we then? We're starting verses 20, chapter 29, verses 1 through 3. Again, I'm going to pause to give some context. Now, these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, and the people, whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And so, to pause, remember, there are a lot of concerns. Those who are off in exile have, have a lot of doubts. They have practical doubts. What do we do? <laughs> you know, exactly how long is this exile going to be? Some people are saying two, some are saying 70. Should I try to build a house? If I'm only going to be here two years, I'll only lay a foundation. You know, what, what should I do? Uh, meanwhile, they have theological doubts. After all, they have been removed from temple. They have been removed from the opportunity to offer sacrifice. They have been removed from what they perceive to be the presence of God. They have a lot of doubts. And so in the midst of those doubts, 
we have many of the, the wonderful words of the Lord. We continue, verse 2. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the high officials, the leaders of Judah, and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Jemariah, the son of Hilkiah. Now pause again. King Josiah, good king, bad king. Good king. King Josiah was a good king, the last good king of Judah. Now, he was a good king who was characterized by reform, reform that led to the discovery of a lost book of the law. A discovery made by whom? Well, ultimately, Hilkiah the priest and Shaphan the scribe. Interestingly, we see that it's their descendants who are still remaining faithful in the presence of wicked kings. Those who were faithful generations before have instilled faithful generations. And so where are the righteous and the faithful? Where is the remnant that God has prepared? Right under our noses. The Messiah would ultimately come from the line of David, but many in that line would be lost all the while God was blessing the faithful forgotten in the midst of the powerful. I find that very encouraging uh, because we, we see that God has made these promises, and yet we see that those who remain faithful in the midst of overwhelming obstacles, God ultimately blesses. We continue on. End of verse 3. Whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, well, what did he say? Wouldn't you like to know? I hope so. Let's read them. So, here, are, here is the answer. How do you live in a conquered land? How do you endure exile? How do you do it? You know, what do we do? Listen up. We're there. Verses 4 through 7 of chapter 29. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses. <laughs> I love it. Build houses and live in them. And plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and father sons who, and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands. So that they may give birth to, your son, to sons and daughters and grow in number there and do not decrease. Seek the prosperity of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord in its behalf, for in its prosperity will be your prosperity. Does the simplicity of these instructions startle you? Were you expecting something bigger, something grand, something more exciting? After all, we, we hear of all this exile. We want revolt. Uh, we want subterfuge. Uh, we want cunning. Well, for 28 chapters, the prophet has been preaching surrender. Why do you expect any different now? And so if I could summarize the message to the exiles in one sentence, and, and really this might be the, the takeaway idea for this whole thing, and I think it applies just as much today. I think the summary of this whole message is in a world committed to destruction and tearing things down, build. In a world committed to destruction and tearing things apart, build. In a culture of lies, build upon the truth. In a culture that destroys families, build up your homes. In a culture that glorifies debauchery, build up your character. In a culture where the wicked rise to the top, be the faith, faithful witnesses who will one day testify against them before the Lord. Jeremiah began, build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. We serve not only the living God, but the God of real life, who starts with real life issues. The exiles weren't sure what to do. Some, some folks were saying exile is going to be short. Others were saying exile is going to be long. What do we do? Build. 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 Settle in. Endurance doesn't come by running away, but by enduring and pushing through. Paul dealt with a similar situation with the church in Thessalonica. Some believers had come to believe that Jesus' return was so imminent, they started to quit their jobs. They're like, hey, uh, I think Jesus is going to come back tomorrow, maybe a week at best. <laughs> Why go to work tomorrow uh, if, if that's the case, right? Like, after all, if you were told with utter confidence Jesus is returning in a week, I doubt any of you except maybe me and Ben are keeping our jobs. Uh, and, and so there's, there's going to be a, a lot of, of unemployment in that situation. And so the idea is, why work today if Jesus is returning tomorrow? Paul's words are instructive and reminiscent of Jeremiah's. 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. 
Now we command and exhort such persons in the Lord Jesus Christ to work peacefully and eat their own bread. <laughs> That's just a funny, eat your own bread. Uh, so contrary to culture, actually, side note, Halloween's coming up despite your feelings about Halloween. If you are a parent who takes candy tax, if you're a child of such a parent, you should just be like, eat your own bread. <laughs> so, so contrary to cultural teaching, the church isn't simply a place for handouts. Uh, when I was at Skyline, an old saying was, if you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean. Uh, or to paraphrase Paul here, don't run your mouth, run a mower. Do some work. If you've got time to worry about every headline, do yourself a favor and get a job. Uh, that would seem to be much of the counsel of, of Paul and Jeremiah here. And reflecting on this, Christians are great at rejoicing in the past and future, but rarely the present. We look back to the cross. We look ahead to Jesus' return. And in the middle, we're like, ah, what should we do? And so, may it never be. Waiting upon the Lord was never meant to be passive, but active. You may not need to literally build your home, but build something. And do some work with your hands. If you're, like, if you're like me, you have a ton of excuses. I recently listened to a man born without arms and legs rejoice in the fact that he's the hands and feet of the Lord. And so your excuses are lame. My excuses are lame. They fall short. They're not good enough. They're just excuses. Uh, they, are, they are evidence against you uh, that you just don't want to do what you're supposed to do. And so now say your home is set. It's all built up. Help someone else build. Or if all else fails, work on building up the church. And I don't just mean our expansion, though that would be nice. Uh, but the church bu bu building, uh, work, the church body, work on building up disciples. And so build something. Secondly, build families. Jeremiah continues, take wives and father, sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may give birth to sons and daughters and grow in numbers there and do not decrease. Build homes, then build families to fill those homes. A culture committed to child sacrifice will die by its own hand, including our own. By design, it cannot last. Families that can't reproduce have a short shelf life. Cultures of death execute themselves as God hands them over to the pit they've dug for themselves. Now, one of the first and most fundamental corporate commands to humanity was to be fruitful and multiply. We see it in Genesis 1. We saw it in Jeremiah 23. It brings us to a delicate issue. Is it sinful not to have children? No, it's not sinful. Jesus didn't have children. Many long to have families, and for one reason or another, in his wisdom, God has not given that gift. In such a case, you should feel no shame. But on the other hand, is it sinful to intentionally avoid having children in order to pursue, pursue your own careers and ambitions? Is it unwise to intentionally avoid becoming a parent, something that is always described as a blessing in Scripture? I would say so. I would say so. And so God's blessing to the slaves of Egypt was multiplication in the midst of a conquered culture while they waited on deliverance from the Lord. God's blessing to the exiles in Babylon was multiplication in the midst of a conquered culture while they waited on deliverance from the Lord. And so if you think we're in a con conquered culture, and we are, then multipl multiplication is one of the ways that God is going to bless us through this. He has done it before. I'm confident he's going to do it again. And so men, lead your homes. Lead your homes. Part of enduring exile means creating places worth saving, creating shelters where people can flee. Now, perhaps it may, may literally come to that, but in the meantime, make your home a place where Christ is undeniably king, a place of laughter and feasting, maybe even too much laughter and feasting, a place of retreat. I have known some men who feel at home at work and at work at home. If that is you, repent. Repent, change your mind, and confess that you have some reordering to do in your life. Thirdly, we see build homes, build families, build character. And Jeremiah continues, verse 7. Seek the prosperity of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord in its behalf, for in its prosperity will be your prosperity. Now, enduring exile, <coughs> excuse me, enduring exile required them to be the kinds of people who would not only put up with their enemies, not only accept they were in a foreign land with foreign gods, but to pray 
for the welfare of the king and people who dragged them away into exile to begin with. Just let that settle in. Uh, what, what Jeremiah is instructing them to do here is like, hey, all those guys, all those people who just slaughtered your families, uh, who just ravaged your women, uh, and, and who, who brought you into their pagan place with wicked, wicked gods, pray for them. Seek the welfare of those people. Seek the welfare of that city. And so end, enduring exile required them to be the kind of people who would not only put up with their enemies, but love them. Jesus said much the same. Matthew 5, 43 to 44, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That sounds really easy until you actually have to do it. It's easy to love your enemies when you don't really have any. But as soon as someone has transgressed you, lied to you, harmed you or your loved ones, you know it requires the Holy Spirit to be able to love that person. Hear the word of the psalmist, <clears throat> a psalm written during, during a time of war. Psalm 46.10, cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. How do we build the kind of character, the kind of character we hear about from the persecuted church, the kind of character we see on display in the life of Jeremiah, Daniel, and Jesus? Well, it starts with prayer. Pray for the welfare of the city. Pray for those who persecute you. As you turn your heart to God, God will turn your heart of stone into a heart of compassion for those you do not know how to love. Hate our leaders? Pray for them. Hate what teachers are doing to kids? Pray for them. Hate those who have hurt you? Pray for them. Building Christ-like character begins with prayer. And so building when everything around you is falling apart is an act of faith, an act of, instead of fear, it's an act of trust. It shows yourself, it shows your family, it shows your community, and even the unseen realm that you trust the Lord even in exile, even in a conquered culture. Now, waiting upon the Lord doesn't mean sitting back with your feet kicked up on a recliner. But we wait by working with our hands, ready for him to come back tomorrow or 10,000 years from now. Martin Luther is credited with saying that if he knew Jesus were returning tomorrow, he'd plant an apple tree today. Likewise, I pray if you... All right, here we are. We good? All right, fantastic. So, that brings us to God's plans. God's plans. Let's continue as we consider the most popular passage in Jeremiah. For this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Do not let your prophets who are in your midst or your diviners deceive you, and do not listen to their interpretations of your dreams which you dream. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. For this is what the Lord says. When 70 years have been completed for Babylon, pause. Let's pause again. So this is what prosperity preachers, false teachers, and even Jesus' own disciples tend to misunderstand about following the Lord. And it is a truth that God has planned good for us and that that good includes suffering. The God who delivers is also the God who judges. The Christ of the cross is also the Christ who will return in a robe dripping in the blood of his enemies. The God who has promised to conform us to the image of his son will bring that about in the same way that he brought it about for his son, through pain and suffering. We cannot become like Jesus in all things without becoming like Jesus in all things. And so when it comes to the 70 years prophecy, scholars are divided on the exact starting point and ending point, but interest, interestingly enough, they all work for example, did it begin in 609 when Babylon came to power and end in 539 when Babylon fell? Maybe. Did it begin in 605 when Babylon crushed Judah and end in 535 when Cyrus the Persian sent them home? Or did it begin in 586 when the temple was destroyed and end in 516 when the temple was rebuilt? Scripture would seem to say, yes, stop it. Uh, 
leave the numbers, leave these things to me. I've got it, the Lord would seem to say. Now we continue in verse 10. I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you, to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for prosperity and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will let myself be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. Uh, Which leads us with kind of the last question to examine here. If God's plans include pain and suffering, then how can we call them good? How do we call them good? Well, first off, they're good because they draw us near. We are told that we seek and find God when we seek him with all of our hearts. Suffering, while painful, is a refining fire revealing all of the things that we tend to prioritize over the Lord. One of the reasons God allows us to endure pain while seeking him is because he is disciplining us like children. Hebrews 12.6 reminds us, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And so the good that God has planned is greater than the greatest good we can plan. Now, it sounds like a riddle, so let me say it again. The good God has planned is greater than the greatest good we can plan, because our plans tend to be what is best for me now, not what is best for me later, forever. God loves us enough to let us suffer today if it means we won't suffer forever. Do you love yourself that much? Do you love others that much? How often do we withhold something painful from others and at the same time withhold a blessing? And so if you're a follower of Jesus, just take a moment to remember your own testimony. How often do our testimonies hinge on a trial, a tragedy? It's in those moments that we often see and depend upon the Lord with the most clarity. And so I encourage you, if, you, if you've had a time of pain and mourning, let that be reminded that that's a time in which you're being shaped, and perhaps you're there now. And remember, if if you are being shaped and molded, it means you are in his hands. And so be encouraged by that. Do not be discouraged by the fact that there's a tragedy going on in your midst. He is working through it for good, to draw you near to him. Secondly, his plans are good because they endure. More precisely, God's plans are good because his promises endure. Did all the exiles survive the exile? No. Did all the exiles return to Jerusalem when they were sent home by Cyrus? No. Jeremiah died without seeing these promises fulfilled. God's plans involve you, but they are bigger than you. God's promise to David endured even though many of David's descendants, from Jehoiakim to Zedekiah, did not. God's plans are good because they revolve around him, not you. Do you realize how freeing how liberating that is. You are not the center of the world. Praise God. God's plans don't depend on you. They endure because he can be counted on, not because you can. I hope I'm not the only one who finds this very, very encouraging because I know how undependable and faulty I am. And so if the whole world depended on me, <laughs> sorry, it's not going to last long. But it doesn't. And, and so because it doesn't, we can, we can be confident that it's going to endure because he, his promises endure. God's desire is to graft you into his plans, to be found by, by you if only you would get out of your own way and seek him with all of your heart. Now, God's plans may not mean good for us today, but they are good for today because they strengthen us to endure until he returns. God's plans include an eternity where we will enjoy his presence, where he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. He will wipe away the tears of parents who have lost children too soon. He he will wipe away the tears of faithful Christians who have lost loved ones who do not know God. He will wipe away the tears of those who have lived faithfully but always found tragedy. The pain of this world will end. The pleasures of this world apart from Christ will end. We will take nothing, nothing with us when we go. When we stand before God, he will not be concerned with how we climbed the corporate ladder or how we died with a lot of money in the bank. He will not be concerned with how many degrees or titles we have. 
No matter how good or how tragic our lives have been, the only defense that we have before God is Christ's blood. If we endure, it's only because he has already endured. Thirdly, his plans are good because they get to the heart of the matter. Go ahead and turn to Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel where the, after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their heart, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again, each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wrongdoing, and their sin I will no longer remember. How tempting it is to see someone who is wayward apart from the Lord and think of how relieving it would be if only they stopped sinning. If only they stopped with the drugs, with the drinking, with the sleeping around. But how often do we mourn for the wayward who are successful in the eyes of the world? Sure, we grieve when our loved ones are doing stupid stuff, but how often do we grieve when our our loved ones have their lives all together and don't know the Lord? Do we grieve the loved ones who are so blinded by their riches that they don't even see their pride? Do we grieve those who in their ambition have sacrificed their families? Am I describing you? God's plans are good because unlike us, he can not only see and judge the heart, but he has the power to revive dead hearts. This truth is good news for those who love him and and condemnation for those who don't. For God will give new hearts to those who seek him, and he'll leave the hearts of stone in those who simply do not seek. Now, in conclusion, God has planned good for us, and that good includes suffering. The one who does, these two truths do not contradict one another. How do we live in a conquered culture? Just as they lived in a pagan land. Build homes, build families, build character. In culture committed to lies, death, and destruction, stand out as one committed to truth, life, and building. And as you do, seek the Lord with all of your heart. And scripture promises you will find him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, a true word, a lasting word, an enduring word, a word of hope and encouragement, uh, a word of truth in a world of lies. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us to be faithful today and help us to endure through tomorrow. Oh, Lord, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.